Welcome to the 13th Living God's Future Now conversation hosted by Heart Hedge. Heart Hedge is an ecumenical movement for church revitalization arising out of St. Martin in the Fields in London, now on four continents globally, but believes renewal of the heart comes from the edge and seeks to catalyze kingdom communities through the four C's of commerce, culture, compassion and congregational life. Since May 2020, we've been running a continuous festival of theology and practice, of which this monthly second Thursday conversation is the flagship event. Please see the notices in the chat or on our website for how to get more involved. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Archbishop Stephen Cottrell, born in Leon C, Essex. Archbishop Stephen has a wonderful combination of Anglo-Catholic spirituality and evangelistic spirit which led him to become a diocesan and a springboard missioner before being made Bishop of Chelmsford in 2010 and Archbishop of York in 2020. He's written 20 books, including a study of the artist Stanley Spencer. In his recent book, Dear England, he said he wanted to become a priest because he believed in God and he wanted to change the world. It's an honor to have Archbishop Stephen with us today. Do please put questions in the chat and I'll do my best to incorporate some of them as we're talking. Archbishop Stephen, you may not, uh, it may not have escaped your notice that there's been a pandemic lately. Um, I wonder what's kept you going and what you've discovered about yourself and God in the last 14 months. Yeah, well, thank you, Sam. And first of all, it, 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 could I say it's, it's great to be with you and, and to speak at this event. And, and I've been really moved and encouraged by what Heart Edge is doing and will do. And uh, I, I'm not here to plug my book, but the other little strap line I had uh, is I, I, would, I do want to change the world one heart at a time. It is about changing hearts uh, as well as changing minds. Um, and um, for me, I mean, I, I've kind of found myself saying to many people over the past year, goodness me, Lent has been long this year. Uh, it, it, it felt like one long experience of having one's life stripped back. Um, but in Christian spirituality, the desert is always a place of encounter. Um, and although I don't underestimate how incredibly hard it's been, nor the awful suffering that many people have experienced and are experiencing across our world, there's also been something rather refining about the experience of lockdown and pandemic putting us back in touch with our own mortality and frailty, um, and then experiencing the Christian life without all the familiar comforts, even the sacraments themselves. I mean, I'm fortunate as a priest and a bishop that I have carried on presiding at the Eucharist. Um, and so it hasn't been a Eucharistic fast for me, but it has for the people of God. Um, and, and just a little story, um, when I stopped being Bishop of Chelmsford on April the 12th, Easter Day last year, two or three weeks into the lockdown, um, knowing my love of the Scottish painter Craigie Aitchinson, the Chelmsford Diocese bought me um, a, a print uh, of, of Craigie Aitchinson, which has hung in my study ever since. And I've spent an ever such a lot of time looking at it in the past year. Uh, and, and, I, and I'm going to just quickly share my screen with you, if it works. Um, uh, now, Craigie Aitchinson painted this picture over and over and over and over again. Christ on the cross, this kind of almost Rothko-esque uh, abstract background, though you can tell it is a landscape, but vivid colours. Christ on the cross, and then usually a dog sitting at the foot of the cross. And I've spent such a long time looking, not actually at this particular picture, but the one that's on my wall over there, very similar. Um, and I think for me, the big experience of the lockdown has been that all I have left of my faith now is Christ. Um, and this image of the very isolated Christ um, has somehow spoken to me in my isolation. Um, you're not even, you know, we're not allowed to touch each other. We're not allowed to embrace. We can't meet. We can't go to church. We don't receive the sacraments. We don't have the fellowships we long for. And yet Christ remains. Uh, the other thing that I like about the painting is that there is one other, you know, 
thing in the picture and it's the dog. And, and I must admit, when I first saw these paintings of his, and as I say, he painted hundreds of them, um, uh, I remember looking at it and thinking, oh, wow, even dogs come to the cross. But the more I looked, I found myself saying, oh, only dogs come to the cross, you know? And I, I don't know what it is, you know, I don't know what you see in it, Sam, but something about the faithful obedience of the dog standing at the foot of the cross um, has somehow spoken to me so powerfully uh, in this last year. Abba Moses, one of the desert fathers, said to the novices, go to your cell, your cell will teach you everything. And I think I, ha I have found for myself in this past year, you know, desperate though it's been at times, the experience of just simply being with Christ with, ev with everything stripped back has been a painful but not unrewarding education in the spiritual life. I I'll, take the I'll take the picture away, but um, lovers of Craigie Aitchinson or new converts, you, you can Google him later. Well, e even the dogs uh, eat the crumbs that fall from yeah. the table. Yeah. I mean, that's such a turning point in the Gospels. It's, I think it's about the only place where Jesus changes his mind. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, and of course, it's, it's all about the big transformation, which is that the Gospel is for the Gentiles too. Yeah, and a refining. That's what, that's what I find interesting about that passage from Scripture, is Jesus' own vocation is refined by the you know, the incredible, tenacious questioning of that very, very um, yeah. strong woman. Um, I just wonder whether whether right now, you know, the, the, the miracle that we are the Gentiles who it turned out the gospel was for, after all, is in some ways matched by the next level, which is the gospel is for the whole of creation and not just for humanity. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's, I mean, I find in these, images of Craigie Aitchinson, strong environmental themes, you know, the, his great love of the created world and the fact that there is nearly all, he sometimes paints pictures without Christ, but he rarely paints a picture without a dog. Um, uh, and uh, again, I find that very interesting. Um, I wonder if we could stick with that ecological theme. We've got the big conference coming up in November. Um, I wonder if you could map out for us how you see creation care within our discipleship, within our notion of the kingdom, why we ever yeah. lost it, and, and how, how Christians may act justly, you know, n n perhaps not just criticize other countries and various leaders, but how we may actually act justly mm -hmm. as the church ourselves in relation to our relationship yeah. with the creation. Yeah, I mean, it goes back again, I think part of my experience of the past year, though perhaps goes back a bit further. As you will know, every 10 years, clergy in the Church of England have the great gift, stipendary clergy, that is, of a sabbatical. And four years ago on my sabbatical, I mean, it's a very hackneyed thing to do, I must, you know, uh, but I walked to Santiago de Compostela. Um, uh, the, the Camino del Norte, I, I walked the northern route, um, mainly because I found out that very few people walk that one, so you're not accompanied by crowds of pilgrims. And I was craving, as well as craving the road, I was craving some solitude. And again, it was an experience of isolation, walking day after day on my own, uh, of refining, a kind of Lenten experience. And the thing that has really come home to me is a, is a new love of the Lord's Prayer um, and the meaning of the Lord's Prayer. And particularly, the thing that I keep coming back to is the petition, give us today our daily bread. And I think, wow, isn't it amazing that I have prayed that prayer daily, not, not for a lifetime, I wasn't, I wasn't brought up in the church, but but I've prayed that prayer every, every day for the last, you know, 40, 45 years. 
And yet I think it's only in the last year or so I've started wondering what it means. Give me today my daily break. Give me today enough for today. Stop me, prevent me, you know, you know, hold me back from wanting more than my share. Um, uh, and I'm caught between, you're the theologian, Sam, not me, but I'm caught between, on the one hand, the incredible biblical theological theme of abundance, God's astonishing abundance. You know, everyone's fed and there's 12 baskets left over. You know, an, an inebriated group of wedding guests are given the one thing they don't need, more alcohol. Um, uh, you know, this incredible abundance that God gives. And yet, on the other hand, this... this learn to live with enough, learn what enough looks like. Um, and, and so, yeah, I don't have any great wisdom to offer other than to say that that's what I'm wrestling with, is what, what does enough look like? And I think the wisdom in, in our tradition about the relationship between the feast and the fast might help us develop not just a theology, but a way of living which is both sustainable, learning what enough looks like, asking for no more than my daily bread, but at the same time, not losing, you know, the great gift of abundance and festival and feast. Um, but in a world where, every, where, where the, if the gold standard is every day must be a feast, then we've had it. Um, so that's, that's where I am in my thinking. Um, and I'm and, and and there's lots of movements, aren't there? Both with, you know in the church, but more so in the world, which are looking at what does you know how how do we slow down? Um, how do we how do we learn what enough is like? How do we recover old old lost disciplines like making and mending and you know recycling? You know, I, I remember when second hand was called pre loved. You know, you, and I laughed and thought. And I thought, I don't laugh anymore um, uh, because that's what we have to recover. Could, could you talk about God in the same terms? God as you know, the times we say, God, you are too much for me. God, you are not enough for me. God, you are enough for me. What, do, what does it mean to find a place in faith where we say, God, you are enough for me? Oh, that's uh, yeah. I think I need. I think I need at least a week's notice of that question. Um, I think where I am is that God is as I see God in Jesus Christ. Um, so what I see in Jesus Christ is that pattern of feast and fast. Um, the ability to enter deeply into the joy of life and the festival of life and the feast of life, um, uh, but also to acknowledge the beauty and power of the widow's might, to, to, to seek out isolation and solitude. Um, so um, I am both overwhelmed by God. Um, it's, it, God is far too much. And yet at the same time, I'm hungry for more. Um, but uh, even as I say that, I think, oh, Stephen, you know, come on. I, I, I am just a beginner in the spiritual life. You know, I, I kind of hate myself when I say these things because I'd hate the people listening to think somehow I've got all this worked out because I can absolutely assure you I haven't. And, and I think that's one of the reasons I've come back to the Lord's Prayer. I mean, who was it who said, I think it might've been, might have been um, Therese of Lisieux, who, whom I love. Um, I think it was Therese of Lisieux who said, if you could say the Lord's Prayer once and truly mean it, you would be in heaven. Um, so the fact that I'm still saying it is ample evidence that I'm not yet in heaven, that I still haven't learned how to say it and truly mean it. Well, well, I'll call you Abba, Stephen, for the rest of the, the, the conversation, if I may, just yeah. to, to keep but, you but, but Let me just push back to you on that very profound question about God. I mean, mm. how, how, would you, how would you answer your own question, Sam? Well, I, I think of it <clears throat> particularly in relation to something like marriage, 
that 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 in that the best thing you can hope to say in marriage is you are enough for me mm. sometimes people say you are too much for me you overwhelm me you're so demanding your mood swings your energy levels whatever it is i can't deal with it and some people say you're not enough for me i i i need more life from you i need i need to have a conversation partner i need to have a yeah. companion you know you're not enough yeah. for me and and so that sense of being able to say enough and i think that's also fundamentally what the Ten Commandments are about, to take another thing that it would be great if we could do once in our life. Um, mm. uh, they're all, the, it's, it's the gospel of enough, you know, mm. that uh, you don't have to steal. God will give yeah. you enough. You, you don't have to sleep around. What, one is plenty. You know, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's a similar sense of, yeah. of, of, of finding joy in the enough rather than always mm. striving for more or panicking about not having enough. I think that's the heart of it, really. And, and of course, those texts, the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, have always been central to the catechetical work of the church. Um, and, and I find it quite interesting that we've kind of lost that a bit, um, that to, to learn to be a Christian is to learn to say the Lord's Prayer, to, to, to learn the ethical life that is given us in the Ten Commandments. And, you know, for generations, if people as you were schooled in the Christian life. So you, as it were, received, imbibed, lived out these texts. Um, and in the work I'm, I'm involved in with the church nationally, one of my hopes um, is that there will be a, a renewal of formation catechesis um, and with it a kind of greater theological literacy um, about these things, you know, not not so that we can all have a degree in God, but so that we can be formed in the in mm. the Christian life because it's a it's a good life. Um, can I can I push you a bit more about one aspect that's come out of the pandemic? It's mm -hmm. um, it it's there's been something very private about about the pandemic because we haven't gone out. You know, certainly in the mm -hmm. lockdown periods, we haven't gone outside that much. We haven't seen each other, mm. and so and a lot of people have talked. Uh, publicly and personally about mental health and I, and I think one thing that a lot of Christians struggle with if they are some people who are prone to depression for example um, that somehow depression expresses something negative about faith that the two can't sit together Julie's asked uh, uh, that question in the chat and and there's mm. something very in terms of of people not feeling good enough for God which I think is a big part of many people's journey of faith. Mm. Um, there's something there ab ab about how how can I be a Christian if I experience periods of depression? I wonder if you could reflect on that, particularly maybe in the light of the last 14 months. Yeah. I mean, first of all, I, I think it would be unusual to find anyone whose mental health has not suffered in the last 14 months. I know mine has. Um, you know, on, on I, I spoke, you know, perhaps perhaps you know, rather too pompously about the great spiritual refinement. I could also tell you about all the telly I watched. You know, um, uh, I've watched more telly in the last year than in most of the rest of my life put together. Um, uh, rather You're enjoyed on the telly actually. now. Yeah, yeah, I've, right, yes, oh, yeah, I'm not so keen on that, but I, I rather enjoyed all the, you know, I watched Breaking Bad for the first time. My kids have been asking me, telling me to watch that for years. I got round to it, thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, but, I mean, we human beings are a totality, um, uh, and and therefore mental health, physical health, emotional health, spiritual health are tied up with one another. And and the greatest danger, I think, is when we start compartmentalizing these things, or, or worse, having a kind of hierarchy that one kind of one kind of um, uh, illness in one area is somehow worse or more serious than another so um so i hold on to that vision of the totality of, of of what it is to be human and certainly do not see um mental health uh, as being any less or more difficult for faith than any other sort of health but but i do know the stigmas attached with it still attached to it do mean that some people of faith do do feel that somehow 
um, mental illness is is something that they should be somehow kind of more ashamed of. Um, um, yeah, I don't think I, I don't think I'm, I'm qualified to say much more than that on, on, on that one. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he, well, obviously, it touches on the Christian ministry of healing, uh, and perhaps that's really where we need to do a bit more work in what do we mean by healing. Um, well, or, or perhaps I, I, I could. Uh, push you into the the territory. It seems very, you know, appropriate at this season of the year, with Ascension Day today, in this period where where we experience Christ has gone, the Holy Spirit hasn't yet come. There's a kind of aloneness, and and you know, if there's if there's one thing I've found more people have said to me in in the last year than ever before, it's that I feel I feel alone, and I I don't feel God with me in the way that I have done before mm. what 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 would you say to someone who said that to you yeah well I think I would I mean I would say I understand that because it has been a very long Lent and and the thing is it's not meant to be Lent all the time you know this is not how it's meant to be um uh and I am a Christian whose life is shaped and sustained by the church and the liturgy of the church and the sacramental life of the church and it's very hard to live the Christian life without those things. I think I would have, I'd add two caveats to that. A, a piece of scripture that I found really helpful in the past year has been the story of the woman who was suffering for many years from hemorrhages, who, 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 out, who out of grace, who out of her grace and goodness doesn't touch Jesus because being in the terms in which she was living unclean, if she touched him, she would make him unclean. So she touches just the hem of his garment. Um, but the, she receives the complete presence of Jesus, even though she doesn't touch him. I found that story incredibly helpful in my isolation, that I cannot access the sacraments, the life of the church, the things which normally sustain me, but I do not believe Jesus has been absent from me, but that is how it's felt at times. Um, but I have been touching the hem of his garment for the past year. But I look forward to the embrace, which is beginning to reemerge. Um, and our faith is a sacramental faith. You know, those sacraments, are the, you know, they're not optional extras. They're there for a reason. Uh, and the reason is that we human beings who are this totality of, mind, body, spirit, emotions, and all the rest of it. Um, you know, the classic Anglican prayer book definition holds good. These are outward and visible signs of inward and spiritual graces. And we need them. And I worry for our church when we see, you know, we downgrade and, and undervalue the sacraments, see them as somehow optional to the Christian life. They are absolutely central until that day when we see him face to face, you know, so I'm not one of those priests who want, I don't, you know, just, just to go on the record on this, I don't want to be buried in my vestments. Um, you know, sacraments are for this life, you know, in, the, in that city, you know, there is, there is no temple. I wonder if I could talk about a difficult subject. Um, I'm thinking of a close friend who was brought up with a very strict sense of purity uh, particularly around sex mm -hmm. and um and somebody did touch that friend and not in good ways and that person was connected with the church um and we have heard many stories like that and no doubt will be people on the this call who've experienced that in their own life experience and the church has been held to account by the ICSA process uh, over the last year um, and has been told off for just saying sorry as if sorry did any good. Mm. Can you chart some path of wisdom and humility and, and grace through all that sorrow and anger and hurt? Well, I, I, I don't know whether I can, but I, will, I am trying to. That's all I can say on that. Um, though what is needed is what is needed is humility and honesty but what's also needed is action um, we, we have to become a 
different church, um, which is uh, less defended, less lawyered up, um, more able to invite, especially those who have been most hurt by the church, to invite them into the room to help us shape the culture and the church that we need to become. And I'm trying to be a voice for that. Um, and therefore, I'm trying to speak regularly with people who have been survivors and victims of abuse in the church, um, because we can learn from their experience. Also, you know, all of us have carried damage, or it's very rare to find somebody who hasn't been damaged in some way by what's hit them in life. Um, and so I, I don't want to other people, I don't want it to be a them and us. Um, but I'm deeply embarrassed and ashamed of the church's failings. I've, I've seen the consequences of it firsthand. Um, and often in the past, our response has been not just inadequate, it has, it has, it has added further abuse. Um, that must change, and I believe is changing. Um, but, uh, you know, I want us to be a church which looks like Jesus. Um, and I think what I see in Jesus is both astonishing compassion for those who've been damaged in life, but I also see a righteousness, a longing for justice and reconciliation. Um, and, and that's what you might call the second mile that we still have to go. So what is peace? Well, you could either, you know, peace could be the silence after the guns are finished firing, or it could be reconciliation painfully embraced. And it's that second vision of peace that, that I long for. Um, but I can't say any more at the moment because I know we've still got some way to go on this. You, I mean, you've got a reputation in some quarters for being someone who has dramatic silences, who, who started a sermon on one or two occasions, maybe more, by saying, I think, rather than me speaking now, we, we all need to be quiet for a mm. period of time. Um, I've heard you speak, but I haven't actually heard the silences, but I'm looking forward to those sometime, but I'm not mm. suggesting it right now. Yeah. Um, but but there is a there is a there is a case for saying the church has been so culpable for so long mm. that the best thing it can do is shut up for a while and 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 and, and, and not try yeah. and talk its way out of the mess it's made for itself. Yeah. No, we 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 you know there's no point in pretending we're not in a good place on some of these issues and we could add others, you know, the, the recent Panorama programme on, on racial um, uh, injustice and racism in the church. Uh, there's a number of issues where we are not as we should be. I, I, I don't think silence is enough, though silence, a, a kind of godly waiting upon God um, and a penitent spirit is certainly needed. Um, but there are things we need to do. Um, and so it's not so much, I, I don't think we should replace the silence with words, but maybe, well, I, I think I said this on the Today programme when interviewed about the ICSA report, um, that, that this, this reading, the ICSA, brought me to my knees in penitence, but that's not enough. I now have to rise up um, and act and help the church to act differently. So, so it's going to be about what we do. We, we need to demonstrate a different way of, uh, of being a much more, well, the phrases that I'm using, you know, the, in fact, the vision for the Church of England, you know, for the coming years is that we might be a more Christ-centered and more Jesus Christ-shaped church. Now, in some ways, that is the most obvious thing to say, you know, we should be more like followers of Jesus. But of course, we also know it is the most profound thing you can say to be a Christ-like church. But that's what I'm working towards. But I think you, you know, I like talking and I'm, you know, I'm reasonably, you don't get to be a bishop, you're not reasonably good at talking. But it's not, it's not about the words, it's about the lives we lead.
And that's that's what I want to see on these issues. So Christ was um, was not a white male. Um, he may not even have been a heterosexual male. We don't know. Um, but but clearly he's been treated as a white male by those who've co-opted him mm. to to serve a, an agenda, an agenda that people are becoming much more aware of, particularly in the mm. last year, as, as I found. And, and in that Panorama program, you had the experience of the presenter putting about 25 reports on your table mm. and then you sort of fessing up that you'd been on about half the committees that uh, that had produced mm. these reports. Um, but it was a very vivid moment in the program. Mm. Could you talk about, you know, there, are, there have been lots of managerial responses. Uh, there must always be a, a, a person of colour on every shortlist, of this kind of thing. Um, could you talk about that more on a, on a level of sin and repentance? I mean, what is the sin at the heart of racism? What, what, what makes it so pervasive, so damaging, uh, so common? Uh, what is the th what is the thing that needs to change more fundamentally than people than than the, the managerial approaches have failed? Well, to yeah, I mean, it, I think we do need to speak about it as sin, and we do need to um, deal with it through repentance. Though, as I said, repentance is is the first step. Then we need to rise up. Um, but um, I think it's the sin of idolatry, isn't it? You know, which is, is you, you, the sin of idolatry is usually close to the heart of most sins that um, that we uh, we create, we worship something other than God increasingly in our culture ourselves. Um, and so we, we arrive at a point where, I mean, let me, this I'm using now, let me stress a trivial uh, example, but it makes the point. You know, when I go to North America, which I do from time to time, I'm usually greeted by people who say to me, gee, I love your accent. Most of us who've been to Northern will have experienced that. The, the typical kind of English Brit response is, I speak norm, I don't have an accent, I speak normally, you're the one who has the accent. Now, now just in that little trivial example, what I've demonstrated is that I consider I am the center, I am, normal is me. And everything else outside of me is therefore abnormal, not quite normal enough, less than normal. And, and that, is, that, is, that is the beginning of a kind of idolatrous view of self, um, which the Christian faith comes to redeem and reconfigure, that we have a new humanity in Christ, um, where there is no Jew or Gentile, there is no slave nor free, there is no man and woman, there is a new humanity. You know, and the great biblical vision at the end of the book of Revelation, every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation, the feast of the Pentecost coming up. Um, you know, if I was in charge at Pentecost, I would have got the whole world to speak the same language, a kind of holy Esperanto. That would have been a much better way of doing a world, launching a world mission. We all speak the same language. The Holy Spirit does the precise opposite. Not we all speak lang one language, the church speaks every language. And today, the Feast of the Ascension is about the whole of humanity being taken up into heaven. So th the biblical narrative really, really confronts the idolatrous human narrative. Um, and, and I'm not ashamed or embarrassed to talk about sin and repentance repentance which means of course reorientation um a complete changing of the way we orientate and shape our life a different sometimes i've described it as the absolute necessity of being eccentric i.e having a center somewhere else uh, to find your center in christ um and uh and it, it's not just racism it's homophobia it's xenophobia all, all of that begins um you know, this is, I'm sounding like a, you know, a good old fashioned evangelical preacher, which, which, by the way, I am. It begins with the, it begins with the enthroning of self. And of course, most of the time we do it and don't realise we're doing it because, hey, I don't have an accent, you know, that you, you do, I'm normal. You mentioned homophobia there, um, the living in love and faith uh, report was published in December. Um, 
you know, that I think there's quite a lot of resignation, perhaps despair around that says people take up entrenched positions, people say they want unity, but they when they feel they have the truth, that always seems to trump unity. What what path through do you see when one issue and one group of people through no desire of their own have become um such a such a point of controversy uh, mm. in, in in a way that that is is well it it doesn't ennoble the church to be fighting in this way mm. uh but but people feel so passionately on different sides of the argument yeah i mean i, I to, to borrow a phrase of the archbishop of canterbury i long for us to improve the quality of our disagreements that would be you know if we just achieve that it would be a good thing but it but it's got to be in the end i long for much more than that but that will be a good start um and if you look back to um i mean the continuing controversies we have about um uh, the place of ordained women in the church um for me the key breakthrough in that narrative happened 30 or 40 years ago when uh, a lambeth conference passed a resolution which said something like whether you agree with or dissent from the ordination of women to the priesthood and the episcopal you are a loyal anglican now, once that was passed, it was after that's just a matter of time. Okay, we've we've that's the Rubicon we've crossed, where we've said actually it's okay to disagree on this one. Then it's a matter of time. So the first base, which I'd love us to get to, is that we could reach a point where we actually say we don't other each other and disenfranchise each other, and say that this is a, this is an area where Christians disagree, and it's okay to disagree. I'd love us to reach that point. I think living in love and faith may get us towards that point. There are other things I'd long to see beyond that. I don't know when and how that will happen. Um, but for me, the biblical vision is, you know, the vision of the new humanity that we have in Christ, which embraces and reconfigures our diversity, recognizing that we are all made in the image of God in that diversity. That seems to me to be the biblical story. Of course, it needs working out. We need to work out what does that mean? How do we live it out, especially with our disagreements? But I am, I, I, I'm not going to say I'm optimistic, but I am, I am deeply hopeful. But I'm deeply hopeful because I believe that's the Christian narrative. You know, this is not about identity politics or culture wars. It is, it is the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. Um, I mean, I, I, I mean, I... Yeah, I'm happy to keep talking when I, I, I'd much rather hear what you think about these things. Sam, <laughs> well, you, I... you said a tantalizing thing just now. You said there's a bunch of other things that you would hope for in relation to the LLF process beyond LLF. Could you just give us a selection of the, the top 12? Well, well, no, I won't give you the I, I won't give you the top 12. But but um, I, I, it 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 grieves me that people who are living in stable faithful relationships feel so excluded from the church um i think well not know, just I, feel but are in well, well yeah yeah so so i you know so i i hope that we will find a place where and i don't know what that'll look like i don't know when it'll come um but i i hope that we will find a way of yeah of of, of address of addressing that but I think there's some, there's a, as it were, there's a prior piece of theological work that needs to be done first. And I don't underestimate how, you know, people listening to me speak, you know, may on, may on the one hand feel slightly hopeful, but I expect also feel deeply, deeply frustrated. Um, but I think there is a prior piece of theological work that we need to do first. And I am hopeful that LLF will deliver that um, and therefore change the narrative where it's no longer about one side winning over another side but everyone agreeing that actually these are areas where it's possible to disagree and now we need to find the ways in which we live with our disagreement with integrity uh, and i don't think that's a fudge i know some people may think it is um i think it's i think one of the, one of the things that people find hardest is that for some people it's an opinion for other people it's their whole life oh yeah yeah which, sort of inequality about that yeah 
which I completely get. Um, I completely get that. Um, but, um, yeah, and I'm deeply frustrated that we are where we are. But I don't think, I, I think it would, my view is it would be, well, I would put it, let me put it positively. I would encourage people on this call to engage with the LLF process, to see that it is a sign of, a sign of hope. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the phrases we use a lot in, in Heart Edge is a, a, a future that's bigger than the past. Widening the canvas a bit from the church, so we'd gladly spend a whole hour talking about ourselves, but but um, widening the canvas a little bit from there, what 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 gives you gives you hope in in the world? Uh, if you were to be Archbishop for another thirty years, which we hope and pray you you will, where well, the laws might have to change. Um, yeah, that's unlikely. But... Um, uh, what uh, what kind of a world when you're in your dotage would would you? Would you be liking, looking to see, and where do you see signs of that, that bigger future appearing from? I mean, the, the things that have motivated me and I've tried to make a contribution to throughout my lifetime have been in the areas of peacemaking and reconciliation. Um, so, um, uh, and I, I'm always coming back to, um, I can't, I, I, I'll now, can't quite remember exactly which bit of the Acts of the Apostles it is, but it's one of the great councils of the church in the Acts of the Apostles, where, where Paul, with his wisdom and intellect and rhetoric, kind of wins the day. And just at the end, Peter says to him, well, but remember the poor. Um, and, and Paul goes, oh, of course, yes, that, I think it actually says, well, of course, that's what I always intended. Um, actually, I don't think it is. And it's, not, it's, it's not the Acts, is it? It's, it's, it's in... It's in Galatians, isn't it? Anyway, mm -hmm. biblical scholars yeah. could put it on the chat. It's not. It's one of the letters I'm thinking of. Um, but he's, when Paul says, yes, of course, that's what I was intended to do. But the church forgets the poor. Um, and so, um, yeah, working for peace, remembering the poor, um, and trying to build a world that works for peace and remembers the poor. Um, you know, that the government's latest defence review, um, so-called integrated defence review. Um, I believe we are breaking our undertakings under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, we're increasing the number of nuclear warheads. Um, I think it should be of grave concern to us. Why are we doing that? Why? I've got... What's that about? Is that proving uh, to America we belong on the Security Council? I, 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 I cannot even begin to understand what that means. It, it goes against the grain of everything that's happened in British defence policy for the last 40, 50 years, and, and actually goes against the grain of, of American defence policy. Um, so, uh, so it's a, a, absolutely, for me, a, a, a inexplicable uh, policy decision and deeply, deeply worrying, though on the whole, people don't seem to be too worried about it. Um, but I think that that Christian witness to peace, that concern for the poor, are, are the two things that I will try to do what I can to influence from the Christian narrative. But the other thing, of course, is the, is the, the environment, the climate. Um, uh, that is the, the big issue which will shape the future of this planet. Um, and as we were saying earlier, I think that Christian narrative about feast and fast and enough has got an important uh, part to play. Somebody's put up on the chat Galatians 2. Thank you so much, wh whoever is the biblical scholar in the room. Um, I, I, and lastly, I want to push something back to you. I, I, can't, I'm, I do apologise because I read, I read your book recently and I can't remember what it's called, but it starts with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in the Burning Fiery Furnace. What's, I'll give a plug for your book rather than mine. What's, what's, perhaps you can't remember the name of your own book, Sam. Um, it, it, well, it might. It was it an upcoming book? Was it something you'd been no, asked No, 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 it's something you've written recently. Okay. Or, you know, anyway, anyway, you start with 
the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which which and I opened the page and I read that read it and I smiled because when people say to me, "What's you know?" Somebody get asked, "What's your favorite story in the Bible?" That's what I nearly always say. Mm. I love that story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Tell, and tell the us why, why you love the story. I love it because when they're going to be put into the burning fiery furnace, because they didn't worship the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had made, they say, um, it, it, we believe that our God can save us. Um, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to worship your bloody statue. <laughs> um, and, um, and I love that, that, that defiant faithfulness that I'm going to go on saying, I don't care. You know, people keep on telling me how naive I am that I, that I say nuclear weapons are a bad thing. But I'm not going to stop saying it. You know, you know, people keep on saying, you know, that it's naive to think that the church could live together with disagreement. I'm going to carry on saying it. Um, because what I see in Christ, well, that's what I see. Um, and so uh, that story I keep coming back to. Um, that we're not going to worship that statue of yours. Um, doesn't matter. You can throw us in the fire. We're just not going to do it. Um, and and I loved what you wrote about the story. I think it, I think it's heart of it all, isn't it? It's, I, I, I think that's where I, where I begin the book with that yeah. story. But it, it's, it seems to me what's what's significant about that story is that the the, the fire is is Babylon. It it is the the, that's that's the that's the experience of exile for, for the Jews yeah. was that they they found in in the fire in Babylon they found that God was with them God didn't prevent them going into the fire God didn't mm. scoop them out of the fire God was with them in the fire and that seems to me to be the the crucial mm. point at which the Old Testament becomes the New Testament yeah yeah and I've I, I found that reflection really helpful. And it's funny, actually, it means we're almost ending our conversation where we started, because it now occurs to me as you speak that actually another way of understanding what's happened in the last year, I've spoken about it in terms of Lent and fast, another way of understanding it is exile. Um, where, and in exile, it is possible, painful, painful though it is, it's possible to actually discover and recover vocation which I think was, you know, was, was a you know, primary experience for the people of Israel, that, that they, in exile, paradoxically, they discovered who they were. Well, this, uh, and, but, it, you know, books like the Book of Esther tell us that there's something slightly different to exile, and that's diaspora. Some mm. of the Jews went to Babylon and then didn't go back to Jerusalem. They stayed mm. in the diaspora. And I guess if we come then to the pandemic and, and, and as you say, where we started, there are, um, a, there, there, there are uh, people who I don't want to go back to February of last year, who have yeah. found something. Could you say something about what you found and what you think the church has found in yeah. the last 14 months that's worth the diaspora, that's worth staying in. Yeah, in well, what... the most obvious thing is what we're doing now. You know, it's been a kind of digital coming of age and um, online church is here to stay and, and we shouldn't be frightened of that. It, it, it doesn't mean we won't be meeting physically as well. Of course we will. But it's, it, uh, and actually, this might be one of the ways we save the planet as well. You know, the whole planet has breathed a sigh of relief um, as we have stopped charging all over the place um enabled ourselves to watch a bit more telly you know there's there's been really good things that we've discovered and now we very urgently need to integrate those into the into the world we we inhabit as as we come out we pray of the immediate horrors of the pandemic and yeah and i think i think learning how to do community and church and other things online um learning that kind of hybrid life is is going to be a huge part of the future but i still long to um yeah i still long to come to st martin's in the fields i still long to do those other you things. are very welcome yeah.
Um, don't forget, we're going on till ten past. So, so we're, we're yeah, not. Yeah. We're not oh, we're yeah. Not so we are. So, so we yeah. are. Because <laughs> we started the, at ten past. The sun has suddenly yeah, come no, you, out you, in Yorkshire. Uh, you, and I, you look like you're in one of those medieval I'm paintings. I'm in beatific light. I don't know what to do. Gabriel about. is about to come and tell you that yeah. you are to you are expecting. Um, yeah. It feels like that's about to happen any second. Yeah. Um, I was with somebody just a couple of days ago who gave me an earful, and it's not the first time by any means, and I'm sure you get more earfuls than I do, not because you're, yeah. uh, uh, you deserve them, but, but because you are in the role you're in, um, who, who, who basically said, let's face it, the church has failed in the pandemic. The pandemic has been a, a test, test for the church, and the church has just where has it been? It's it's just not shown up. It's just not got any answers. I I think I I don't really want to push you on that in relation to how many meals we've taken to how many houses or how many churches yeah. we've left open or or how many how many local officials we've we've berated because they won't let us sing or or what I I don't really want to pursue it on those levels, yeah. but. But I'd like to keep it on the theological level. Yeah. What does God um, think God is doing? And and why has the church not managed to articulate a response to that challenge? What what is this all about this last fourteen months? What what's really been going on in the mind of God? Yeah. Well, well, I I want certainly I would want to push back strongly. And yes, I've had lots of people say that to me, and I think it's um, I think it does the church a great disservice. So although I I, I understand you don't want me to talk about all those other things. Um, I'm not going to stop you as so long as you don't get back to the archbishop's kitchen table. No, but 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 I but I think go. I think the fact you know if 14, 15 months ago, not that not that the Church of England has this authority anyway, but if there'd been a central diktat from the Church of England saying we want the whole of the Church of England's worship to move online tomorrow, you know, can you imagine the you know the ridicule that 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 would have been met with? And yet that is what happened. You know, what happened is simply astonishing that, that you, know, you, know, so, you know, virtually every church and some in the most creative ways. I mean, what you're doing through this is, is very creative, but you know that it's mirrored a thousand times, literally 10,000 times up and down the country. Churches doing the most amazing things and building new communities. So many churches saying, we have built a new community of faith online. Now, we don't know what's going to happen with that, but I keep on telling the clergy I serve, it's always, it's always important in life to put your problems into two piles. And one pile is headed, nice problems to have. This is a nice problem. We've got, so many, we've got people coming to our online church. We don't quite know what to do with them when the pandemic finishes. Well, I think that's a nice problem. Um, so we should not underestimate the creativity and flexibility and adaptability not just of clergy, but I want to big up the clergy who've mm. who've headed up that with lay leaders, of course. Um, what about uh, God, though? Uh, what, what's what's been in the well, mind? Yeah, exactly. But I do want to say that because, um, I mean, yeah, if I could take the very high spiritual ground, uh, you know, what is the big question facing the human race? The big question facing the human race is we have to learn how to inhabit the planet in a sustainable way. I'm not suggesting for one moment. Uh, let me be absolutely clear that God sent us a pandemic. I don't think that for a moment, but I do think uh, many of the scientific um, uh, inquiries into the origins of the pandemic do point us towards the possibility um, that the you know the pandemic uh, uh, arose um, in ways that are connected with our abuse of the planet um, and certainly spread. Um, very quickly because of the ways we inhabit the earth. So though I'm not saying, of course, that God sent the pandemic, um, we cannot simply say the pandemic came out of nowhere. It came out of somewhere which is connected with the way we inhabit the world. Therefore, this has given us an opportunity to reflect deeply on how we inhabit the world. And I think that's God, for me, that is God, God who is the Redeemer. Um, uh, the God, I mean, another favourite passage from scripture, John 6, um, uh, after the 5,000 have been fed, Jesus says to the disciples, gather up the fragments, let nothing be lost. 
and, and I believe God is always working to gather up the fragments. And so what I see in the pandemic is God inviting us to reflect deeply upon the way we inhabit the planet. And I hope and pray that out of it, we can then begin to tackle the much greater crisis and challenge of the environment um, in a visionary and much more far-reaching way. So that's, that's where I would see God at work. Can I suggest that there might be something facing humanity even more significant than the ecological questions? Mm. Um, something that I find gets almost no attention, um, and that's artificial intelligence. Oh, because yes. artificial intelligence promises largely to make human beings obsolete. Uh, obsolete as far as employment is concerned, uh, but obsolete as far as existence is concerned. You know, in a few years, artificial intelligence will, will enable things to be done without humans that were entirely done by humans, even now. Mm. Um, it, it'll take a lot of employment away. It'll create some other, some, but it begs the whole question of what it means to be a human being. Mm. That seems one of the most fundamental questions of all. Um, it seems we are rightly preoccupied about the planet, obviously obsessed about the pandemic, but sleepwalking our way into this huge question of what it means to be a human being, yeah. paying almost no attention to it at all and leaving it to you know, the people in inventing the technology. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Now I am looking at the clock thinking I'm not sure I've got much time to say anything very wise on this one, but what I would what, what I'd recommend is you invite the Bishop of Oxford onto one of your webinars because not not, not that he's got all the answers, um, but he has been leading um, or one of the people leading in the Church of England in trying to engage with these issues. Um, and uh, my own experience with this is uh, 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 in my work in the House of Lords, I spent several years on the uh, Select Committee on Communication, looking at issues of uh, how we might regulate and legislate for regulation in the, uh, you know, in the, in the internet, looking particularly at Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, uh, and, and the like, which which led me into beginning to have some engagement with the issues of artificial intelligence, alerting me to the fact that, you know, not, I try not to use Amazon, but I'm afraid I do use it from time to time. And when Amazon says, if you bought this, you would like, you might like this, we should all be very worried about that. Um, because Amazon's usually right. You know, if you bought that, you will probably like this. Um, you know, they know an awful lot about you. Um, now, that is at the very probably less worrying spectrum of artificial intelligence that I'm at, you know, re really, I think Facebook should be paying. I don't, I'm not on Facebook either, but Facebook should be paying us for the data that they mine. Um, uh, but, it's, but it's all at the moment the other way around. Uh, yes, Kazuo Ishiguro's book is really, really, Helen's just put that on the chat. Um, so, uh, but I, I'm afraid I don't have much wisdom on this, Sam, but it, but, I, but uh, I, 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 why don't you have the last word on this one? Well, I, I think I, I wanted to finish on Ascension Day, really, since it's, uh, we're mm -hmm. preventing people participating in worship by, uh, by occupying people in this conversation. Uh, the problem with Ascension Day for me is it, is it sort of keys into what you might call some of the clumsiest parts of uh, of our Christian imagination, you know, feet disappearing through the tops of, of, of mm. paintings and things like that, heaven being up there. Um, but perhaps most significantly, and that's my, what I hoped you'd comment on finally, is is how does this story end? You know, the, 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 the two figures in, in the Acts passage say, he will come back in the same way as as he went away D does the story does the the story of god end in that way with christ coming again does heaven come to earth or do we go to heaven 
how does the story end? Yeah, well, briefly, I think first of all, the 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 the, the, the men gazing up to heaven are basically told stop gazing up to heaven. You know, um, so, you know, addressing very much the point you make. You know that that you know don't get caught up with the staring up into heaven, feet disappearing. What actually happened? Focus back on the earth. And yeah, for me, the the biblical vision is not about me going up to heaven but the new heaven the new earth the new creation um which is about you know again let's finish with the lord's prayer your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven and the invitation of the christian life well is to change hearts and minds um to to, to inhabit the world and life differently as we see it in christ and therefore the ascension is not about jesus being absent but about the new presence of Jesus through his church and by the spirit to build a different sort of world. Mm -hmm. Well, Archbishop Stephen, you've shown, I think, very um, disarming humility uh, and very inspiring imagination. And we've been blessed to be with you for an hour. Um, and we're very grateful for you because we know that you're in the process of changing the world. And thank you for taking an hour out of that to, to be with us. Uh, we're very honoured uh, by that opportunity. Just to say for, for others that Lucy Winkett will be joining me on the 10th of June back at six o'clock, our usual time on the second Thursday for the next of our Living God's Future Now uh, conversations. Archbishop Stevens made a plug for one or two other people who maybe should join us in the future. And we'll look forward to that. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Do join in our other Heart Edge events. This is about the renewal of church and society. We're all in it together and we need each other uh, to, to do the best we can and, and to, to fulfil the potential of this movement uh, for being a blessing to the church and the renewal of faith. Thank you very much for joining us tonight, especially to Archbishop Stephen. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>